now has had any impact in helping uh, women with cancer of the breast. And this is according to a publication uh, from the New England Jour Journal of Medicine. Let's look at some of the risk factors. Uh, they can be uh, uh, many, but all of them in general are related to the exposure to hormones and especially um, uh, estrogen. Now, estrogen is a um, endogenous hormone, uh, and uh, even though it is completely natural and produced by the ovaries, it is known as a carcinogen. Uh, in other words, it causes cancer. And then there are the exogenous factors like xenoestrogens, um, the ones uh, that are uh, produced by um, pesticides and plastics, for instance, or um, estrogens that are injected into animals to gr make them grow faster and produce more milk. And, and so that's uh, uh, one of the easiest ways that we are overexposed to estrogen. And so um, we can reduce that by making some uh, changes. Now let's look at the medical intervention that uh, increases the, the possibility of developing uh, cancer. Well, anything that increases the amount of estrogen that women ingest will increase the possibilities of cancer of the breast. So oral contraceptives, the, the famous pill, increases the incidence of cancer of the breast. Uh, hormone replacement therapy is a major factor in the explosion of uh, cancer of the breast. X-ray exposure is also a very important one, and um, many doctors are recommending women to have you know, their yearly or bi-yearly uh, mammogram. Let me tell you that every time you take a mammogram, you increase the chances of developing cancer of the breast by 2%. So if in 10 years you take two mammograms a year, you already increase your chances by 20%. Uh, so there are much better ways of, of doing early detection, like a good exploration. Women can learn how to explore their breast, and if they find anything abnormal, go to your doctor. Uh, then we have sonograms and MRIs that have no x-rays that are very, very effective in detecting tumors. And I only recommend a mammogram when there is um, a red flag uh, in any of the studies that I mentioned before. Another um, <laughs> thing that culturally has increased uh, tremendously the amount of uh, cancer of the breast is the fact that women are not breastfeeding anymore. Uh, through breastfeeding, you feeding you actually cleanse your ducts, and that way the the, the risk reduces. But since uh, women are not breastfeeding anymore, the incidence of cancer has increased. And also, abortion uh, increases the. Uh, the risk of developing cancer of, of the um, breast uh, up to 100 to 110 percent, and I will show a study later on this. So the, the reason, the main reason for um, cancer of the breast, as we know now, is a imbalance of hormones. During a normal menstrual cycle, women will produce the same amount of estrogen as they do progesterone at different times, and uh, progesterone is a natural antidote to estrogen. In menopause, what happens is that the production of both uh, hormones reduces dramatically, but they still, in uh, ideal situation, will remain at constant uh, or uh, the same amounts, even though much lower. So what's happening now is that due to those cultural and environmental changes that I mentioned before, we live in what is called estrogen dominance, where um, uh, all of those chemicals that increase the production of uh, estrogen are not available uh, for progesterone. So progesterone stays at a lower level. And it is this imbalance that produces or increases the risk of developing cancer of the breast, of the breast tremendously. Why? Uh, um, did God uh, provide uh, women with estrogen if it's cancer causing? Well, because God provided a, an estrogen window and a, a time of exposure to uh, estrogen that begins in menarche or, you know, from the first menstruation to menopause, which is the last menstruation. And this window used to be quite 
small, but now it has increased because of the type of uh, diet that our girls are having. They begin, they begin to menstruate about five years earlier than what they should. Normally, women should start menstruating at 15 or 16, and now it is rare, and many uh, mothers will take their child to see a doctor if they're not menstruating by, by 10 or 11 years of, of age. So right there, we've increased the, the window of exposure. Another one is a diet. The more protein and, and fat women consume, the higher the production of estrogen is going to be. Then the xenoestrogens that you find in pesticides or the estrogens that are injected into animals to make them grow. The other one is uh, we as doctors are terribly increasing this window by providing all pre, uh, perimenopausic and menopausic women with estrogen replacement ther therapy and uh, thus uh, uh, extending menopause. Uh, women should be menopause between, they stop uh, menstruating between 45 and 50 at the most and, and right now most women never really go into menopause because we artificially maintain a, a high estrogen production uh, through uh, estrogen replacement therapy and so now we are faced uh, women having a tremendous view uh, or window uh, of estrogen and thus the explosion of cancer of the breast. Right now 20 million women are on hormone replacement therapy that is synthetic. 1.4 million who reach menopause each year uh, increase this number uh, uh, or maintains that number. The recent findings show that the risk of hormone replacement therapy out outweighs the benefit. They used to say, no, well, you know, there's more women that die of heart attacks and, and uh, actually um, uh, hormone replacement therapy prevents heart attacks, so uh, it is uh, better to prevent heart attacks with HRT than uh, cancer of the breast. And of course now we know that this is not true. In May of uh, 2002, after 5.2 uh, years of research, the study was stopped because the risk exceeded the benefit. That is, more women were dying of, uh, of heart uh, attacks that were taking HRT in comparison to the ones that were not taking it. And of course, a lot less uh, cancer of the breast was diagnosed during that uh, period. So the results indicate that this regimen uh, should not be initiated or continued for primary prevention of cardio uh, uh, or coronary heart disease. Um, so that is not a, an indication anymore. Um, uh, the um, doctors that take care of women, OBGYNs, obstetrics and gynecology, uh, have uh, published a, a study in The Lancet. This is the most important uh, medical journal in England. And they said that the cumulative incidence of breast cancer in developed countries would be reduced by more than half, by 57 uh, percent, that is from 6.3 cases to 2.7 cases per 100,000 population, by age 70 if women would have more children and would breastfeed longer. And uh, as I mentioned right now, uh, modern women are not having any children and when they have their children they begin at very late uh, stages in their life, uh, you know, 40 or more, uh, and uh, they barely will breastfeed because of the um, deformation that, or the aesthetic results after breastfeeding is not acceptable to them and all of this has to do with culture. Going back to uh, abortions, a study that was uh, published in Epidemiology in 89 said the New York women who had abortions experienced a 90 percent increase in risk of breast cancer. And, and because this uh, was relied on medical records rather than interviews and, and sometimes uh, the fact that the woman had aborted was not in the interview, they really considered that this uh, 90 percent increases to 110 percent if uh, you take into consideration the fact that in many um, medical records there is no record of the abortion. So uh, prevention now is considered to be risk reduction and it's not true. Um, the risk of breast cancer uh, can be reduced by changes in lifestyle but not by early detection like uh, mammograms and uh, biopsies like uh, th those are really not the most important ones are lifestyle changes. Women that exercise four hours a week have 66 percent less cancer of the breast. 
66% drop just by you doing four hours of exercise uh, uh, a week. And, and really, the most important thing is walking, brisk walking. Window shopping is not enough. You have to really go out and walk. And the, the, the more you sweat, the better the benefit. Uh, if you want to go to a gym and, and, or, or practice a, a, a sport, uh, organized sports, anything that will get you at least four hours a week will reduce the risk of, of, of cancer. Now, they say that uh, medical intervention, uh, like uh, surgery, removing the breasts of women with high risk or chemo prevention, uh, have reduced. I, I really uh, can can tell you that if you look into the statistics, this is not true. The only thing that really changes or improves the lifestyle of, of uh, I, I mean, that reduces the risk of cancerous lifestyle changes. And the only chemo prevention that works is natural chemo prevention with nutrients, especially, as we will see a little bit later, natural progesterone that reduces the impact of estrogen dominance. Uh, of course, a, a better diet makes an, an incredible difference in not consuming foods that are contaminated with um, uh, with pesticides or meats and milk <coughs> that uh, were produced by or increased uh, production by hormone manipulation. So organically grown meats and milk as well as uh, fruits and vegetables will reduce significantly the possibility of uh, uh, developing cancer of, of the breast. And uh, talking about common sense, that should be called something else because it's not very common. Uh, the current evidence on dietary fat and breast cancer risk has been judged sufficient to support ongoing full-scale breast cancer prevention studies. Again, diet makes a very, very uh, um, significant impact on breast uh, risk, breast cancer of the breast reduction uh, risk reduction. So um, uh, reductions in fat intake is number one and reductions in endo and exogenous estrogens as I mentioned before. So how can you reduce this by consuming a lot less fat and protein in your diet that is consume more vegetables and fruits and then consume foods that are organically grown. Let me show you this very interesting study. This is from the um, uh, uh, China study or the China project. This project was uh, designed by uh, three countries and three different very important institutions. The um, uh, uh, Cornell University in the United States of America, Oxford University in the UK, and the University of China and it was supported basically by the government of China as well as the governments of the UK and the US. And uh, uh, this is just a part of it. This is a major, major study, but it is showing the relationship between fat intake and the development of cancer of the breast. So here in the bottom line, we have the amount of intake in grams per day, 30, 60, 90, 120 grams per day, and here we have uh, the incidence of cancer per 100,000 population. So in countries like Denmark, Canada, Australia, the U.S., and the U.K., where they consume more than 120 or around 120 grams of uh, uh, fat per day, they will have an incidence of more than 90, uh, uh, between 80 and 90 uh, cases of breast cancer per 100,000 population. Now uh, look at this. When they consume less, like in Germany, that they're between uh, 80 and 90, uh, Belgium, Austria, Italy, and France, then the incidence drops to about 50 cases per 100,000 population. Other countries that consume less, like Spain, Greece, and Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia uh, where they consume around 60 grams per fat, the incidence drops to about 30 to 40 cases per 100,000 population. And then the countries that have no money, like Mexico, Salvador, or China, to buy expensive meats and fats, or Japan that chooses to eat correctly, the incidence drops to around uh, 10 to 15 cases per 100,000 population. And this is directly related to the amount of animal fat that people consume. 
So risk reduction really has to do with um, with a diet and exercise a lot more than through the intake of um, of uh, 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 chemicals because there are studies that show that if you take tamoxifen or aloxifen, which are hormone blocking agents, uh, these are chemicals. These are chemicals that definitely block the production of estrogen, and they will reduce uh, cancer of the breast, but at a very high price. Um, I would uh, tell you that lifestyle changes is a lot more effective, effective, or the use of phytohormones. These are hormones derived from plants, and obviously natural progesterone is the most common, widely used, and now uh, um, it has um, proven to be very effective in reducing the uh, risk of developing uh, cancer of the breast, and it makes a lot of sense, and on top of it is a lot less expensive than any of the other drugs. So uh, rather than chemo prevention with uh, tamoxifen or, or, or other uh, drugs, I recommend natural prevention or natural prevention. This is a study that was published in 2000 in the New England Journal of, uh, uh, of Medicine that says that phytoestrogen is natural progesterone are plant-derived compounds with estrogen agonist and antagonist effects that have been linked to low risk of breast cancer in some observational reports. So already we know that it makes a lot of sense. Now, early detection with mammography, uh, sonography, and MRI, which I already talked a little bit about, uh, has to be done very carefully. As I mentioned to you, every time, every time you take a mammogram, uh, you increase your chances of developing cancer of the breast. So it's much better to do sonography and MRI. But early detection is that. A lot of people consider I'm going to do my preventative action and do a mammogram. That has nothing to do with prevention. If you find an early cancer, you didn't prevent it at all. It already appeared. So uh, a lot of uh, doctors are selling to you the idea that early detection is prevention, and it's uh, an absolute lie. We can prevent with exercise and diet changes as well as the use of natural progesterone. Once we go and find something early, it is not prevented anymore. Breast exams are very, very important. If you feel anything uh, abnormal in your breast, go to a specialist for them to determine whether you need to do a sonogram or an MRI. And the last thing that I would recommend is a mammogram. But mammograms for diagnostic purposes are very valuable. As a screening test, I do not believe that it's of any uh, help to women, and there are many studies that show that. Again, in the New England Journal of Medicine, said that intensified screening may identify disease at a favorable stage, but it does not prevent cancer. Um, now, in this very politically correct world where nobody is at fault, we are trying to find you know, why women develop cancer of the breast, and it is not their fault, it is due to genes. And uh, the world cheered to the discovery of the breast cancer gene 1 uh, in 94, and then in 95 was the BRCA2, uh, the breast cancer gene 2. And uh, what they were able to, to prove uh, more or less was that women with mutations in either of these genes, the BRCA1 or 2, have a lifetime risk of breast cancer of 6 to 85 percent in comparison to the 12 or 13 percent that other women have. And on top of that, they have a, a higher risk of developing cancer of the ovary. Um, uh, much higher than the rest of the population. But you see, having the gene just by looking at these numbers does not mean that you are going to get cancer. On the other hand, on the flip side, 95% of the women that have cancer of the breast do not have the gene. So my, my, my message to you is that the gene has very little to do with it. There are studies that show that women with the gene that change their lifestyle never developed cancer of the breast. And unfortunately, many women that have the gene are now having both of the breasts removed in their children, in their uh, young women uh, around 18. Uh, the mothers will take them to surgeons to remove both breasts just because, just because, because they have the gene, or, or one or the two. And my recommendation is that all you have to do is change their lifestyle to reduce the risk. On the other side also is that uh, um, removing the breasts will not uh, assure you 100% that the woman will not develop 
cancer. And, and so we're basing this on genes. And let me, let me just show you this slide that I think is very interesting. In China, the incidence of breast cancer is 1 per 100,000 population. In America, it's close to 150. So you would have to assume that if it was the genes, the BRCA1 and 2, that the Chinese don't have it and that the Americans have it a lot. But the truth is that uh, it's not the genes, it's the lifestyle. So why is it that women are in, in China are not developing cancer uh, of, of the uh, breast is because, as I mentioned before, women in America are consuming more than 120 grams of fat per day, animal fat, while the Chinese are consuming less than 20. Americans consume 91 grams of total protein against 64. But look at this, the difference. While Americans only consume 27% of the 91 grams from plant protein, the Chinese, most of the protein, 60 out of 64, is from uh, vegetable proteins. In other words, 7% of the proteins the Chinese consumes comes from animals, whereas 71% of the protein consumed by American women come from animals. Uh, fiber, the Chinese consume three times more fiber, and carbohydrates, the Chinese consume three times more carbohydrate. If you add up the calories, they're about the same, and yet Chinese tend to be very, very lean in comparison to American women. And uh, the other fact that uh, supports this is that uh, Chinese that migrate to the States in two or three years develop the same incidence of cancer if they consume the American diet as Americans do. So genes have nothing to do with the fact that uh, cancer of the breast is uh, there or increasing. Now, what are the alternatives? Uh, now that you have all of this uh, background, the other thing that I want to mention is that it is very uh, devastating for everybody that in spite of so many advances, um, more women are dying of cancer of the breast every year. And so that means that in spite of the advances, we are not having progress. And uh, to eradicate uh, breast cancer, we must take uh, obviously political action so that uh, research is done in a different way than it has been done now because we have not uh, obtained any good results. And education uh, so that everybody understands that good habits, good diet and exercise are very effective in reducing significantly the uh, um, appearance of cancer of the breast. And then include research on prevention only 2 to 3% of the dollars given for cancer research are spent on prevention. Everything is spent on treatment. And lastly, I believe that we need to look for alternative integrative therapies that could be a lot more effective, and, and that is what I want to talk to you now. Let me show you this case of a 51-year-old uh, uh, female with uh, cancer of the breast that came to us in uh, January of 2005, uh, riddled with metastasis in the liver. All of these darker spots that you see are, are malignant tumors in, in the liver due to breast cancer. She was given two to three months to live. Uh, by July, that is six months later, she was not only alive, but as you can see, the tumors are much smaller. Some of them have almost disappeared like this one, if you compare this one to this. Uh, this is the gallbladder, but th these two tumors used to be three and very large. Uh, here is all free of cancer where, where she used to have, you know, three little spots. So uh, uh, with integrative uh, uh, alternative therapies, we've been able to save many women that otherwise thought that they would die in a few months. This is the same patient. Not only did she have metastases to the uh, to the liver from the cancer of the breast, but also to the um, to the lung. Many, many tumors in, in the lungs. By July, again, uh, a lot of the tumors here were gone. The others are much, much smaller, as you can see. This one, for instance, in comparison to uh, the, the later x-ray, this one disappeared, and this one became a lot smaller. So integrative alternative therapies can be very, very effective. Here you see the drop in her tumor marker, the CA2729, dropped from 1,000 
to the hundreds. The normal is 48, so she was very getting very close to normal. This is another patient that came to us after surgery, chemotherapy and radiation therapy, cancer of the breast. The cancer of the breast came back. This is this ball here. This is what we call a CAT scan. This is what we call a PET scan. And this is a combination of the PET and the, and the CAT scan. This is the newest tool, the newest toy that we have <clears throat> to uh, uh, see tumors. And with this PET scan, you are able to see tumors that are very, very small in comparison to the CAT scan. So this is a, a wonderful tool for diagnosis, to, a tool for diagnosis. Uh, as I said before, this patient had been treated with surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, very uh, uh, different types of chemotherapy, and, and she was sent home to die because there was nothing else that could be done. With our integrative therapies by September, from May to September, as you can see, the tumor now is much smaller. And by October, the tumor was completely gone with completely natural alternative therapies that take into account everything that I mentioned to you before. Uh, this is another patient that came to us with cancer of the breast with massive metastasis to the liver. They were so massive that, uh, this is another one here, uh, that they occluded the bile ducts and because of the bile ducts were occluded, she developed jaundice. And when a patient has jaundice, you cannot give them chemotherapy because chemotherapy is toxic and the patient is already intoxicated with their own bile. So we could only offer uh, alternative natural therapies. She also had metastasis to the lungs with a lot of liquid. All of this is liquid in the lung. This is a tumor in the, in the lung. This is another tumor in the lung. Tumors also in the um, in the bones, this is a vertebrae, and as I mentioned to you, the very large tumors in the liver. From May to July, we started this therapy, and as you can see, the tumor in the lung, this one disappeared completely. She still had quite a bit of liquid. The other tumor in the lung also disappeared. The bone improved, and the tumor in the liver reduced by half. By this time, there was no more jaundice whatsoever. The patient was walking, doing very, very well. By uh, August, uh, the the tumors in the lung, all of them were gone. The liquid was gone, so now it's normal. The bone metastasis almost disappeared, and the tumor reduced even more. So we had a reduction of about 90% in, in, in the tumor, from uh, 964 cubic centimeters to 150 cubic centimeters. The patient is still alive now and doing very, very well. Uh, when uh, the patients come to us, um, with advanced cancer of the breast, um, and, and we treat them with uh, integrative alternative therapies, um, we are able to see a major difference between our results and the results of, um, of uh, conventional therapy. So after five years, we have three more, uh, three times more patients alive than with conventional therapy, uh, uh, 25 to 75 percent. 25 with conventional therapy are alive after five years, 75 with us. If the patient is uh, virgin to treatment, comes to us without any chemotherapy, with advanced cancer of the breast or stage four cancer of the breast, uh, the results are even more uh, uh, impressive. So uh, patients that have not uh, received uh, harsh therapy um, that come to us first even have better results.